One is the LNG pipeline is underway, right? The Kitty Mat pipeline is one of those things that whenever something is happening, we don't talk about it so much. That's a positive, right? Keystone has been approved by the President of the United States. There are some, some hurdles to still get through, but we're moving along that path. Trans Mountain has been purchased. Now, you know, in the perfect world, we'll get the right stakeholders owning that pipeline, which will be the private sector, our pension plans, the First Nations, mm -hmm. and we'll get that energy out to Tidewater more responsibly than any nation in the world. So I think that we're, there's a small gap here to getting where we need to beat, uh, where we need to get to. When I look at our renewable resources, I look at the energy that's produced out of Hydro-Quebec and the long-term agreement that's been signed with Massachusetts. That's also a very encouraging sign of getting our energy out to market. So while there are bumps in the road and it's never easy to get to where we want to get to, I do believe that we will get there in, in, in due course. There's a lot of talk about getting there uh, on the energy file especially. There are so many now different voices pulling in different directions. What, is there a single thing? Is there a policy change? Is there a role for the federal government? What do you want to see happen to break the logjam? I think the most important thing is Canada can fuel the world. There are very few nations in the world today that are endowed as well as we are with the resources that we have. Renewable, non-renewable, agricultural resources. And it's about us coming together as a country to be able to deliver that. I look at it sometimes like the way I look at our bank. Our bank's competitive advantage is us working all together across our business units to deliver what our client wants. The more mutual reliance and the more interconnectedness there is within Canada in terms of getting our resources out to the market, the more success we have. The more we speak as individual voices, as regional voices, the less likelihood we'll have see success. I'm a big believer that we're going to get to the former and we will come in a very unified and connected way and make Canada a better place because these resources are what fuels our quality of living. And at the same time we started planting the seeds for the future in terms of the innovation economy, whether it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, the service-based economy, all of which needs to grow. Right. I think Canada also has a good runway there too. Well, on the resource front, I mean your most recent results really paint a picture, right? Canada flat, growth in the U.S. Does that, is that a reflection of the future? Is that, are we looking at kind of a stagnant Canada for a while? No, I think Canada and the United States' fortunes are inextricably linked. The United States has put some tax reform in place. We've tried to respond appropriately to make sure that business continues to invest in our country. But I think as long as the United States continues to grow, Canada will continue to grow. If we can get our natural resource file right, Canada will continue to grow. If we can make sure that we have the skilled people to take on the innovation economy and we bring permanent long-term capital to help those businesses, I think Canada will grow. And it may not grow at two to three percent, but right now what I foresee in the next four to six quarters is decent growth. Do, can we expect you to grow in the U.S., though? Is that a business that you will only expand? We're, we're very encouraged by our investment in the United States. Uh, as a bank, we've really focused on what do our clients need? And every time we talk to our clients, whether they're personal clients, government clients, pension clients, or, or companies, increasingly they, they, they point to the north-south flow. And that's why we've put our capital and our investment in building a stronger, more resilient, client-focused North American bank. Four years ago, we have 4% of our profits come from the United States. Today, it's 17%. We've told our investors that we want to get to 25 to 30% over time. We'll do it when the right opportunities present themselves. Right now, We've been very encouraged by the investments that we've made, Amanda. We had nothing in the wealth management business in the United States. Today we have $50 billion. Only five years later, and assets have been under administration. We've introduced private banking to our clients. We're building those relationships. The investment in the private bank, which is now CIBC Bank USA, was supposed to be accretive uh, early next year. It's already accretive because the team is doing a fantastic job. The organic growth that we're seeing from the existing business from our cross-border business, from organically expanding into new markets, with some help from tax rates and some help from interest rates, has delivered the goods for our shareholders and we will plan to continue to do that going forward. Is that enough to offset what might be continued weakness in the Canadian market? It'll deliver a better diversified bank. <laughs> do you expect continued weakness in the Canadian I market? I expect the Canadian business to do well and I expect that it won't be as easy as it was in the last couple of years because we're further on in the economic cycle and the United States has had significant tax reform stimulus, mm -hmm. but I expect Canada to be on a slight upward sloping curve. What is the biggest risk in this economy and therefore to your results? I think the business biggest risk right now is uh, 
political risk around the trade agreements, candidly. I'd like to see those resolved. You know, right now, there are three things that I always focus on. Where are interest rates going? And it, it seems as though they're kind of staying put for a while because there's no inflationary pressure evident to any of the central bankers anywhere in the world today. The second thing is technology and how they can dislocate your business. So we're really staying on top of those trends and where technology is most relevant for our clients, for defending the bank, for defending our clients' data, that's another area that we need to stay on top of. The third is the political risk that really comes with the trade agreements. And that's something that's out of my hands, but I believe that in the end, we'll explore all avenues and we'll come to the right place. In your last quarter, it was second quarter in a row that you missed uh, street expectations. You raised the dividend. Was that a tough call to even if profit wasn't doing exactly what people were hoping to offer more to shareholders? We're always guided by our payout ratio and as our earnings grow over time, we just grow our dividends. It's as simple as that. Is there a risk to you in the housing market when people do talk about the downside scenario for Canadian banks? It really is the housing market softness. Have we gotten where we need to be with that market? I think the regulators have put in some very good regulations and consumers have adapted to it. What you're seeing is them buying smaller homes, uh, you know, uh, borrowing less. Mm -hmm. I think those are all good things for the prudence, prudential stability of our, of our, of our economic system in Canada. The other, uh, the other line from a short on Canadian banks was that uh, there's no Canadian bank CEO who's seen a real downturn in the credit cycle, um, which is true. Uh, d is it in your culture, is it still in your mind that bad things can happen, things can actually go back to a place that you haven't seen for a long time? Well, I'm well into my 50s, so I've, I've been in professional life for quite some time and I did see that down cycle and I do recall it, maybe not as the bank CEO, but I recognize when economies go sideways and what we try to do is build a resilient bank. Everyone continues to focus on the Canadian consumer. Usually what happens in the end, if, if things go really soft or if the GDP does go negative, then you see losses typically occur in the unsecured part of the portfolio, not in the residential mortgage portfolio or in the private economy. And you feel comfortable that if should all of the worst case scenarios happen, that's all okay? We are, yes. Are you actually asking, or is there a cultural change around uh, HELOCs, around the types of mortgages you'll do on the uninsured side? Is there any kind of shift in thinking? You know what, the, the, the constant focus at CIBC is how do we do the right thing for our clients? How do we manage the risks within our portfolio? And how do, over the medium term, we deliver decent returns to our shareholders that will, they will reward us for in terms of the stock price?